Hi there, welcome to this segment of the show. Like I said in the beginning, my guests today are none other than Bishop Feb Idahosa and uh, Reverend Laurie Idahosa. She's laughing because we were, before we came on the air, I was trying to see how best to address them. <laughs> so we're playing to so many audiences here. <laughs> in South Africa, I could easily call you Feb. And uh, Laurie, in Nigeria, some people will be shocked for me to call the Bishop <laughs> Feb. You're welcome to the show. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Good to be here. Thank, thank you, you so thank much. Thank you for the opportunity. And you know, the, the beautiful thing about today is that we're recording this episode on the date of the anniversary. This is their 17th anniversary today. It's the, it's the, it's the 18th of October. Of October. Uh, for those who didn't send gifts this time around, that would prompt you for next year. Oh, no, no, we can still take one year. Though. It's a one year anniversary. It's a whole year. So anytime you send it, it's local. So, Bishop, we want to talk about your love story. 18 years down the line. Yes, sir. Is the wine still sweet, Larry? <laughs> No, I don't know about the wine. What kind of wine? I don't know which wine we're talking about here. But, uh, the, the wine of Christian love. Show, the yes, wine yes. of love. The Christian the wine family of show, love. Christian show, yes. The wine of, wine love. of love, yes. yes. It's super sweet. Praise God. Yes, I heard someone say one time that you should look at your marriage through the lens of saying, you know, how, how old would a child of that age be? So if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're a year old in marriage, how old, how, what would that, that one year old child be, be like? Mm. If you're five years old, if you're 10 years old. So our, our marriage is 17, so we have, a, we have an old teenager. Mm. And so um, mm -hmm. our marriage has been developing over time. And it's like that older teenager is about to become an adult. Things are, going to, things are about to get very, very, very sweet now. So I think, yeah, we, you know, we, we've enjoyed I, I being married. A, I don't want to be a young adult. I just want to be a teenager. <laughs> now, they said the teenager age is a turbulence age. Uh, so does that apply to Bishop in the marriage? Your analogy there, does it? Yeah. I mean, they said it's a turbulent age. The 13 to 18, 19. Right, because see what happens when... when when you, when you just get married, the first year, you, you're, 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 you're like a little child. The child can hold his head up like that. He needs support. He needs so many, so many things that you need to have um, to help make your marriage go stronger and stronger. And by the time you get to 10, you get to 11, it's strong. You've been through different things together. You've had all the fights that, you, mm. that, you, that you're going to have for the first time. You're month. exhausted already. You're, you're exhausted <laughs> those fights. You the fights fight. are just on repeat. Right, exactly. <laughs> and then you learn new things about each other. You know, mm. I was talking the other day online. I said, you know, every time you, every time you um, as you get married, things change. And you have to learn every single time. So mm. you learn from the good. Not from the bad. So you learn from the arguments. When you have an argument, say, what did I learn from that argument? You learn from the good things. How does your wife respond? How does your spouse mm -hmm. respond? So you know how better to do things next time. Mm. So as, as time goes on, yes, uh, I think by the time you get to 10, things have matured. Mm. By the time you get to 12, 13, things begin to change again. Uh, 15, 17. So 17 for us, I think, has been a good year. We're, we're going to talk about what you learned and all that soon. But let's go back. You met him <laughs> at the age of 13. Your dad was friends with Archbishop Idahosa, the late Archbishop Idahosa, his dad, and you people met when you were 13 and he was 14. You said it was love at first sight. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> was it love at first sight for you, Bishop? Uh, well, the answer is yes and no. Of course, you know, you look back now and what we call love then, um, well, I would say it's not love because I, I want our children not to try that. <laughs> They're watching, they're actually yeah, watching. Right. <laughs> Not at 14. <laughs> so what were you trying then? Tell us what you were trying. No way, we're not telling you what we were Yes. No, I think well, we saw each other and there, were, there was a connection right away. Yeah. And I think the thing about us is that every year from that time on, we always had a connection where we always talked, we always met at least once a year. And so over time, it blossomed from the beginning. So when we were 20, 20 and 29, I think I was 29, about to turn 30. Yeah, about to turn I was 29. 27. Yeah. But yeah, so it's about to turn 28. So that's when everything just sort of came together and the love. How did you know, how did you know she's the one you should marry? Oh, good, good. That's good. We tell that story sometimes. Um, for me, I think um, I didn't know until we, we tried to, how do we finally get married? Okay, let me, let me, let me tell you that story. Remember 9-11? Yeah. 2000, September 2001. Yeah, 2001. You know, there are times in life everyone remembers some certain dates where they were. Mm -hmm. For us, we, we were, um, I was flying to the U.S. at the time, and I was going for a conference. And as soon as we got into U.S. airspace, that's when the whole World Trade Center event happened. So our flight was diverted to Canada. And so I spent two days in Canada in a, in a resort somewhere, 
And during that time, we were talking on the phone and sharing things, just, just sharing what's going on. Um, after that time, I got a chance to, to go back into the States, but I couldn't go to where I was going. My conference was canceled. And so I, we drove down to um, where she was living in Delaware. So in that time, um, all the, the, everything was in, in, in flux. It was in turmoil. We just kind of different. So we began to just talk and just share with each other. We spent time together. We spent some days just talking and just renewing our friendship again. And at the end of that time, I just remember thinking, you know, you're someone that I can trust. Mm. I can trust you with my with my life, with my with my secrets, my things that I've, that, that my my future thoughts, my future plans, and my past mistakes. My mm. you know everything just sort of made sense. And so that's when it sort of clicked that this is the kind of person that, that I've been looking for. Mm. I should be looking for mm. not just for a friend now, but for a spouse. Mm. And then that's when wow, wow, together. that is so mm. beautiful. I want to go back to the beginning of your marriage and a particular incident that turned out to be a great testimony but in the beginning was quite tough right. for you. Uh, Laurie, you entered marriage expecting to give a child to Feb and uh, it didn't turn out so. Right. You went through years of not being able to give birth to a child. Tell us a bit about what happened. So it, when we first got married I wanted to be the perfect um, Nigerian wife. I wanted to fit all the mold and do everything that everyone expected me to do. And inside that stereotype was being able to give birth for him. And my husband being the only son of the great Archbishop Benson Hosa, I felt this responsibility to quickly give him children, mm. or to quickly give the family children, so that uh, there could be an heir to the Idahosa name. Mm. And of course, I, I didn't really put too much pressure on him, and just was this thing in the back of my mind, yeah. like, we better do this and we better do it now. <laughs> um, but when it didn't happen quickly for us, in fact, within the first year, I was disappointed month after month, and I'm saying, you know, why aren't we getting pregnant? And I decided that we should go to the U.S. and do some testing, and he was like, testing for what? And he went online, or you know, we began to talk, and he says, you know, we're not even technically considered infertile until yeah. we tried for a year. Right, right. Um, but we decided to go ahead and do some testing. And when we did, um, the doctors tested him and tested me and told us that uh, between the two of us that we were 99.9% .9 infertile, that we would not be able to have children without doctor's intervention. And so it was a, a shocking news to, to us. I remember crying in the doctor's office and just feeling like, how is this possible? And he just kept saying to me, honey, we're going to have our kids. Uh, the same story was my parents' story. They were told no children. Look at us now. Right. So that's, it's, we're not going to we're not going to suffer this. And but throughout a series of conversations, I was able to convince him to allow us to start the in vitro fertilization process, which was what was prescribed by the doctors. Mm. And we started and it failed. We tried again and it failed. We tried again and it failed. Mm. And every time that we did it, um, I just felt like my my belly kept getting bigger mm. because I'm pumping myself full of injections. Um, people are saying, oh, congratulations, because they think they thought that you were pregnant there. already. And it was just loads of hormones. Mm. Um, my emotions were all over the place. Um, and my husband just kept saying, honey, God's going to give us our children. And I'm like, okay, yes, but let's try another idea. <laughs> <laughs> and so finally we went to, we did some research, and we found a hospital in New York that um, we had found had the best results. Um, the best outcomes and so we decided to go there and spend the extra money to to go through that avenue and we finally got pregnant um, mm. through IVF and it was such a such an exciting pregnancy for us I remember I carried the pregnancy like an egg like mm. I remember I was in the train because where I'm from in the US was mm. about a two-hour train ride from our hospital in New York and so I was in the train carrying the pregnancy, like putting my feet up on, on the thing, like the baby's going to drop out, you know, and it was just like, what, four or five weeks pregnant. And, um, but that was how I just held on to that pregnancy. I didn't come back to Africa at all during that pregnancy. Wow. I didn't want to get malaria. I didn't want to get typhoid. I wanted to make sure that this baby is fully protected from anything and that our environment could have in it. And so we had agreed that I would stay in the U.S. for that entire pregnancy. And then we gave birth to a handsome baby boy wow. um, on the 3rd of July, 2007. And we were so excited about this baby, you know? That's six years after, yes. after mm -hmm. marriage. And, um, but unfortunately, we told the whole world. We called yeah. everybody all around the world. We've, we've had our baby, you know, this wow. is before social media. So yeah. we're using our phone to call everyone. And, um, but then unfortunately, the next morning, uh, the baby was in the nursery. The doctor said that they wanted to monitor him 
for a period of time because I had had a C-section and they wanted me to recover a bit and they said by tomorrow morning you'll have the baby back in your room with you and then the doctors came in and the nurse came in about what five o'clock in the five morning, o'clock in the morning. And um, she said, uh, you guys need to come down to the nursery. Um, something's not going well with your baby, and you need to come down immediately. And I couldn't even walk at that point. I was still in a wheelchair, and so they, they wheeled us down to the neonatal unit. And when I went in, I'm seeing them do chest compressions on my wow. baby. Wow, wow. This is the baby that obviously we prayed for. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I had a background in medicine as yeah. well as him. And so we both had this... Understanding that someone not, was seriously wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This and is so the heart had already stopped yeah, at that point. Yeah. And um, we're just like, no, 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 do everything, do everything. And this can't and, be happening ever. No. And so we started praying. We got people from Malaysia, we got people from wow, Nigeria, wow, from all around the wow. world to pray with us. In fact, we filled the entire hospital with my father's mm, church members. They, they overran the whole neonatal mm. unit just praying and speaking life that our baby would live um, but unfortunately he didn't mm. and our miracle baby died mm. um, and I remember when they when they handed me Ben because we called him Ben mm. after Benson Itahosa mm. Benson Andrew Itahosa mm. and when they handed when they handed me Ben he was already gone and I just remember looking at him and at that moment I knew that I knew that I knew that I was going to be a mom at that moment, at that moment right. and by the way, that was the first time you were carrying him, yes, right. as a, because as the a first time they brought him, they just showed him to you, exactly. and you were only carrying him as a dead child, mm-hmm. but you knew that you knew that, that you knew. knew. And like something just shifted in me, and I'm like, no, 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 this is not the end of our story. Wow. And this, and of course, my eyes are swollen with tears, and I'm crying, and mo- I mean, I was, I was emotional as you can get when you lose a child, but I still had this faith rising up on the inside of me this this confidence rising up on the inside of me that this is not the end of our story where did that come from from god <laughs> i know i know no, no other i know but you know the thing is that during such moments of intense pain and mourning it's so easy to have our emotions drown away everything every exactly. communication yeah. from god and uh Feb, you were going to say something about Yes, no, I was saying that and in, in those kind of times, it's, it's difficult because the pain is so much. And, you, and as you said, the noise from the pain is so loud. And then that's when your heart has to connect to the promise. Mm. Because if, if you have a promise that is strong and that is pulling you, then inside the pain, the promise can pull you out of the pain. Mm. Um, it's, you know, because for us, for example, when we were told that we couldn't have children, you know, there, there was a thought that we said, they told us it's 99.9999999 chance of no children. Of no children. Okay, so, and I'm thinking, okay, my mind says, tell me, the devil has no new tricks. Mm. The devil has used the same tricks for years. Mm. He used the same tricks with my parents. Wow. Told them they couldn't have any children. That was the same value. Same trick. exact trick I used on them, but it didn't work for them. It didn't work on them because I was here. I have three sisters. <laughs> and so I said, you know, that trick will not work on us either. Mm. So we have to just have a promise that will pull us through this time. Mm. Now, but it's difficult, like you said. It's, mm. um, it's, it, it sounds easy now because we're looking yeah, at the bag. I I know it, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so look back, it sounds easy now, but, but during that time when, when we had that pain, why we're crying inside the tears we still knew that like you said this is not the end of our story wow and i think we have to t- tell those who are watching to mm. as well the devil's tricks don't work yeah. they, they, they've never worked before if yeah. you can tie yourself to what god mm. has spoken to you mm. that promise that promise can pull you through the pain mm. that's on. really good you know what we're going to do is that we're going to take a quick break and we'll come back and talk about just how God brought about his promise. We're talking to Bishop Feb Idahosa and uh, Reverend Laurie Idahosa and it's their wedding anniversary and we're talking about their love story. Don't go away, we'll be right back. Welcome back to the second part of my interview with the Dahosas on their love story. It's their wedding anniversary today. It's their 17th wedding anniversary. And we're right here at the Faith Arena and the headquarters of the, of the Church, of, Church God. of God Mission International, of which uh, uh, Bishop Feb is the re- resident uh, bishop of, the, of Faith Dome. We were talking before we left uh, Feb, we were talking, and of course, Laurie, we were talking about this stage where God by his spirit did not allow your your pain to drown down his promise mm-hmm. and that's I love what you said before that it's difficult to get hold on to the promise in the midst of the pain but the promise is still valid right. yeah. so the promise
please how tell us what happened afterwards you cried a lot you mourned for a long time yeah. you said something happened at the funeral of your son Ben yeah so at the funeral we had a very close family friend mm. who was like an elder brother to my husband and we asked him to come in and preach the funeral and as he was ministering he decides that he's going to prophesy against our knowledge yeah. <laughs> uh, he decided that he was going to prophesy and say that a, a year from today God's going to give your family a reason to rejoice well that was on the 9th of July 2007 and I knew look I just had a c-section on the third um, I'm doing IVF <laughs> doctors there's no way on earth they're gonna let me to try let me try another IVF right now so I you're probably saying don't play any trick on us right, don't, exactly. don't use this uh, church church thing exactly. on us. Right. <laughs> and I was kind of like you know so after the funeral I said well, I appreciate what you said. I think you could have told us privately. Yeah. You're humiliating us to seven thousand people. And he just laughed and he said, "You know what? This is what God, God spoke told to me. me." And I have to say it as God said it. Wow. And um, so we took it, we received it, and we just kind of put it on the back burner. Yeah. And we had all kinds of things happen when we got back to Nigeria. We had people telling us that uh, the devil took the baby from us. Mm. We had people telling us it's because there was sin in our life. Or I know that line. To, <laughs> we need to fast. In fact, we had one, one minister who told us that we need to fast and pray, dry fast for 30 days before he's even willing to pray for us. For the sin you've come yes, into. Sin, exactly. <laughs> and we just began to hear all these strange voices. And we just began to say, you know what? We're going to let the mind be in us, which was in Christ Jesus. Wow. And we're going to shut out these negative voices, voices of fear, voices of doubt. And, and we just began to trust God. And we honestly... Um, weren't really thinking about getting pregnant at that, at yeah. that point because I was still kind of recovering from mm. the C-section and of course we're recovering emotionally from the loss mm. and we're putting all of our effort into our responsibilities here into our hospital that we we're mm. building for women and children to kind of help us out here in Nigeria where mm. you know they don't have some of the facilities mm. that we have mm. over there and so our energies and our efforts were being really put into that um, when it was around November and I just said to my husband, I'm like, do you know I haven't seen my period since I gave birth to Ben? Mm. And he's like, well, you know, we don't know about these things. Mm. We've never, we'll never been here before. before, yeah. So he's like, why don't you um, just do a pregnancy test mm. or something? You know, but um, maybe, I don't know. We didn't really know. And I was actually thinking of giving a doctor a call to give me something to help induce yeah. menstruation. <laughs> and um, so we... I did a little pregnancy test, one of those home pregnancy tests in the morning, and I looked at it, and I was seeing that it was positive. Wow. And I mean, we're talking no doctors, no injections, no nothing. And I mean, of course, there was something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, something. No, no other thing than no that. No other thing than just love. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so, I just, my mom was visiting at the time, and so I went into my mom's room, and I'm like, mom, 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 and she's like, Lori, when I was having babies, we didn't even have home pregnancy yet. <laughs> I don't know anything about this. Let's go to the hospital. Wow. And we went to the hospital, and then they confirmed it that truly we were pregnant. Wow. And the wow. amazing thing about God is that the pregnancy followed the same path month by month as mm. the previous pregnancy. Wow. Um, I conceived about the exact same time. So when it was December, I was the same amount of... Yeah. You know, it was wild. And then when the doctor says that she wants to do another C-section... Mm. She schedules it for July 9th, 2008. The day. Yeah. The same day. <laughs> One year after. Yeah. Like so the so called false prophet. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I just said to my husband, like, I'm not comfortable with that because I feel like we're pushing God's hand. <laughs> Even though she gave it to yeah, me. Yeah. And um, I'm like, no, so let's get her to do it later or earlier, but not on that night. I've had enough miracle as a team. Yeah, you know? <laughs> and, um, but interestingly enough, um, that morning, she, she said she was still going to schedule mm, it for the night. Mm. She didn't change it. But that morning, about 3 o'clock in the morning, my water breaks. Wow. Mm -hmm. So who is pushing it now? You or God? <laughs> no question. We're going to have our baby. Wow, baby. wow, wow. Um, Feb Jr. is now 11 years old. Wow. Isn't he wonderful? Yeah. Very, very Isn't he marvelous? Mm -hmm. And he's so fantastic. And all the while he had his plans. Yes. Right. So the one says it's sin. The other one says it's the yeah. devil. The one, yeah. I mean, we have, I mean, we, we're experts in as fact, Christians. I was even pregnant mm. when the one told us to do dry fast. 
I was pregnant. Can you imagine if I listened to the prophet of God? I, I mean, uh, Bishop, how does this affect, how did this affect your theology? I mean, you went on later to have two more children without right, right, any, right. any artificial help, right? Yes. Laurie, I mean, you have three boys now who will be showing on the screen as we speak. <laughs> 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 but how does this whole thing... Let me say why I ask this question. Yeah, so we, we, we have an understanding of faith. You claim it, you get it right now. Mm -hmm. you, you can say the right words, you press the right buttons, it's going to happen. And so many people are frustrated. Yeah. So many people are, are hitting their head against the wall and they are wondering where is God? I've right, done, right, right. gone through the whole process. Or maybe it's the devil now. So they go into the deliverance circle where they're praying all these prayers and deliverance. And How does this speak to our theology? Excellent question. See, for, for me, I, I got to the point where um, I, teach, I teach these three principles now that, that we learn because we learn them the hard way. And I tell people, you know, Faith has to become real to you, you know, as real to me, as real to you as this chair I'm sitting on. Because mm. when I say what is faith, we'll say, okay, it's the substance of things hoped for. Mm. And we say faith is belief, faith is trust, faith is confidence. And those sound great until you are inside mm. the place where mm. you need faith. Mm. And at that point, then words don't mean anything. Yeah. Because for us, when we say, say we're having faith, we believe that, yes, we have children. Mm -hmm. But it took us five years, six years, and we're at this point. So faith went from just being words. Mm. So something that was as real to me as something I sit on. Now here's, here's the part that's, that's dicey. Because you go through that and then after having faith and believing and it seems as if you went to God and God is watching and what you've been praying for is just taken goes away. away. Exactly. Yeah, that's and so you're saying the exact same thing. Yeah. Where is God? Yeah. And how can God let this happen? So for me, it, it had to become real like that. So how does that affect my theology? It affects it in the way that if you're, if you're a father watching a child getting immunized. The child is sitting there and the child doesn't, doesn't understand mm. fully why they're getting immunized. Yeah. So the child is sitting, okay, they see an injection and they see the father there, so they, they're confident. Mm. And see the nurse or doctor come with the injection. And they're saying, Daddy, are you watching while they're about to mm. give me this injection? Mm. And so the pain that the child feels when they have the injection mm. is not so much from, um, from the pain of the mm. injection, mm. like, but Daddy, you're, you're watching me. Yeah, you're them seeing them hurt me and you nothing didn't stop, didn't stop them. Exactly. <laughs> and that's me. That, that's how, how I have felt. You know, I'm thinking, okay, God is watching us mm. go through this pain. Mm. God is watching us. We have mm. believed mm. and we've seen this. How is God allowing all this happen? Mm. Well, God began to speak to me and speak mm. to us through this whole process. Um, I, I can do a whole show on, on mm. what God spoke to us. Uh, Please because say, tell us some of it because this is important. It's, right. This is what we go through, whether it's through barrenness or through other hopes. Somebody told me the other day, hope defied makes the makes heart sick. And I said, right. yes, but you know what? Hope in God can never make mm. the heart sick. True, so true, tell true, us true. what you learned. True. So well, we learned so many things. For the biggest one for us, I think, was the fact that um, people, 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 people asked us, there were three questions that I dealt with during that time. Uh, one of them was, is God really good? You say God is good, and here he is, a line this happened. So is God really good? And God showed me through, through the sounds, through the scripture. He said his mercies are new every morning. His goodness is there forever. And so that I had to trust and believe in, and that built my faith back up again. Um, they asked another question about, about, about the one about sin. Um, a, uh, a bishop called me at the time. I was a pastor there. He said, Pastor Feb, what sin did you commit mm. that God allowed this mm. happen to you? And so I began to shake my head. I said, that's true. Okay, really, what did I do? Was it this? Was it that? Was it that? And, and those kind of things can shake someone's head. Yeah, brain. that's true. And we're thinking, okay, what did we really do? And God showed me in the book of Romans that it says it is the goodness of God that leads man to repentance. Mm. So God will not really punish you to lead you to, to point you to repentance. No, he will show you wow. how good he is. Wow. Um, a, a parent will do that to their own child. Mm. So we learned that in the process. And, um, but, but through it all, like I was saying, you see that God allows some things to happen because when you ask questions of why, people mm. say, well, can I ask God why? Mm. You know, so you shouldn't ask God questions. Don't yeah. like God is unquestionable. Yeah. Well, that's not true. The, throughout the scripture, God shows us that you can ask mm. him questions. Mm. Elijah asked mm. questions. Mm. Moses asked God questions. And even Jesus mm. on the cross mm. asked God why. Mm. Mm. Here's what God taught me about mm. this. God said, you know, when you ask me questions about, about why, mm. you're asking about things in the past. Yeah. And I will not answer you with the past. Mm. I will answer you with the future. Mm. And so he showed us through that whole time. Mm. Uh, when, we, when we were crying and mm. in why tears for the baby, why is this happening? God spoke to us at the altar the day we buried our child. He mm. said, look, if this can happen in America, mm. what happens in Nigeria? 
I want you to go back to Nigeria and open a hospital that will take care of neonatal, neonatal issues mm -hmm. of children and women wow. and everything. So in that year that we lost our son, we opened the hospital in our hospital um, called Big Ben Children's To hospital. help others not to lose exactly. their children. And I have so many testimonies. No, that no, no, this is powerful. This is powerful right there. Right. So out of that point was born a new child, a hospital, right. even before you got your babies. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. And I mean, God, God gave us the, the, the equipment was donated to us. People, people gave up wow. things. Wow. And so in that one year, we, had, we opened the best point in the city at the time. Wow. Um, um, unit Glory in the city. to God. Now, that was God doing that for his bigger promise. And I told you that, you know, when, when, when you've been immunized, the parent watches it happen because they know this is good for you, wow. good for other children wow. around you, That's good awesome. for your future. So wow. they allow some things to happen, not because they don't care about you, but because they care about you it's enough. It's a big picture. It's a bigger picture. Wow. Wow. So we opened that. And as we opened, as we opened that, God gave us our son. Mm. Now, today, he's 11 years old. Mm. Um, so God bless other people as well. I have mm. so many stories about children okay. that were born that time. I met a lady a few days ago. I was telling the story <laughs> in, my, in the class. And she said, wait, wait, she raised her hand. So I said, so what is it? She said, I was the first baby born. I had my, sorry, my, do, my son was the first baby born yeah. in that hospital. Wow. I said, really? We, we miss it when we just focus on ourselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. And pain, once again, I take your word where you say it's so easy to let pain drown, mm. down, drown away the promise. Right, right, right. And if we would just be careful to manage our pain properly. Mm. Now, we have to move on here. Let's talk no problem, again about no your anniversary. <laughs> what are some of the things you can teach us from, from this journey of 17 years of love? Some lessons you go like, these are some things that I've learned. I think it's really to accept your spouse for who they are and not who you expect them to be. Mm. And I believe that early in marriage, I had um, such a very different idea of mm. what marriage was going to be mm. like or what marriage to him was going to mm. be like. And I discovered that it wasn't much of what I had originally envisioned or thought. It was better than that. Uh, but it needed for me to accept him as he was and not put him in a certain category or uh, put any expectations on him beyond what God puts on him. And I just began to love him as the man that he actually oh, is, wow. to respect him and to honor mm -hmm. him and to really embrace his culture. Mm. Um, to embrace his family and um, his calling. Mm. Not that my own calling has by any means been shelved. He no. supports my calling mm. and I support his calling mm. and together we're making an impact. Wow. Uh, but I really believe that it's just to love your spouse for who they are and to accept them and to... Um, to stop trying to change. Yeah. I, Don't be the Holy Spirit. Yeah. <laughs> I think I just stop trying to change him. I mean, um, of course, I still work on his wardrobe. Sometimes, yeah. sometimes he needs help. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, and for but, you, Feb, what, yeah. what, what, is the, what is the thing you've well, learned? So, so many things. Um, we, 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 we've been sharing online for the last couple of days yeah. um, what some things that we've learned in marriage that mm -hmm. helped us do that. Um, you shared one about how a wife's commitment deepens when a husband defends her. Ah. And a husband's commitment... Um, Deepens when his wife was the word they put it. Supports his ambitions. Supports his ambitions oh, okay. and his dreams, etc. And and for us, I, I look at that and I talk about okay, for for us, we've gone through where there's no social media to another where there's social mm. media. Mm. I think one thing we have to learn is that you know, we have to put our 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 closeness and our our in, our intimacy and everything mm. first, right. and put everybody else outside. Outside. So social draw, media can't be where you, you draw go. a circle around exactly, yourself. Okay. Right? Right. You know, Please one, go. Yeah. One of one of our um, one of our counselors told us about that. That there has to be a circle where it's just mm. you and your you and your mm. spouse. Mm. Then maybe family comes outside, but everybody yeah. else now. But now yeah. social media now everyone wants to take everything out on social media. Oh, my husband did this. My wife did that. <laughs> you have to keep it tight. No way. Don't ever do. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, if you're not following them yet. Go ahead and follow them. I do follow you guys, and I think it's fun. Awesome. Uh, so fo much. Follow them. They, they, they're the wonderful group of people to follow. There's so much fun. <laughs> There's so much life. We didn't get into the fun part. We'll get into that in the next interview. But to round up, what are you doing today on your anniversary? What is? Uh, <laughs> except it's a secret. But <laughs> yeah, secret. Um, we're having a party tonight. Um, in our home, we've got about maybe like 50, 40, 50 couples that are coming over that are good friends. And um, we're playing 80s and 90s love music. <laughs> and, um, we've got it kind of set up like a 
I know, it's just going to be a really cold night. It's just about <laughs> dancing and kissing and romantic games. Uh, Does he dance? He dances. <laughs> <laughs> he did salsa dancing before we got there. Uh, He's even taught me some of his dancing. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I think you have to have fun. You can't be serious yeah, all the time. So yeah. you're on one side, so you're serious side. But you have to have, also have fun, especially with your spouse. Yeah. I think she is a fun factor. <laughs> now, Zoran, what is your last word as we wrap up this issue, uh, this uh, episode on your love story? What's your last word when you talk to married people? Uh, I mean, look into the camera and say something to married people. Hmm. You want to start? Or no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think to everyone who's, if, if you're just getting married, um, th- th- I think love is not what you see other people do. Love is what you build. Mm. Love is what um, you decide you want to have with your spouse mm. and with your future. So let God speak to you about, about what it is that he wants you to have in your marriage. But don't begin to look at everybody else and say, well, what they have is perfect, what I have mm. is perfect. There's no perfect marriage. Mm. Um, there are issues. Everybody has issues. Mm. But love is what you build mm. and it's what you bring into it that mm. decides what comes out of it. Wonderful. Laurie, you want to say something? I support that 100%. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that guy in the committee. Yeah. Is yeah. What I wanted to say is what he has no, just said. That. I, I concur. I concur. <laughs> no, 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 I, just, I just believe that truly as a wife um, that we have a responsibility to our husbands to nurture his dreams and to nurture his vision and to find a way to support it, find a way to strengthen him, find a way to be that voice in his ear of reason, find a way to, to just be there for him when he needs advice, when he needs strength, when he needs someone to talk to and you'll find that your your marital bond will grow so much deeper when you take your eyes off of yourself and your needs and you put them on your spouse and their needs and I, that's what I've seen with my husband he treats me like the apple of his eye uh, he puts my needs before his needs and I do the same thing for him and I think because we prefer one another over ourselves that's one of the gifts that we have in marriage that has helped us to remain strong and has helped us to really be an example for other homes because we're not all about us, we're about one another, we're about our commitment to the kingdom. Wow. Let, can I add one quickly in the last few, yeah. last few seconds? I think for the African context, um, many people look at, and your, your, your external family want to come in and jump into your marriage mm. and, and do so much. If you, well, this happens all over Africa, mm. from north, mm. south, east, west. As a husband, you have to defend your wife. You have yeah. to let everybody know that this is your wife. This is not our wife, mm. even though it's nice, our mm. wife, but really, this is your wife. Mm. Um, so you have to defend her, stand in between your family and her, stand in between whoever needs, if whoever wants to try to come in there. Because at the end of the day, you always have to have somebody to go back home with. Um, someone said one time, said, if, you, if there's going to be an argument between your wife and your family, your wife and somebody else, remember who you go back home with that night. <laughs> So choose that's, carefully. That's a wise <laughs> one. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bishop Feb and Reverend Lurie, for, uh, for being here on the show. Thank you for your testimony you. that you've kept. Thank you for the love story you've cultivated. This garden and the aroma goes out through the whole of the world. And we pray that when we come back to the 28 and 38, if the Lord <laughs> Jesus has to come back, we'll be talking about sweeter <laughs> wine. We've been talking to Rev, uh, Reverend Lurie and uh, Bishop Feb Idahosa, and it's their seven. 17th wedding anniversary and uh, it's been so good having you on the thank show you. and thank you for having thank us you. in your space. You. This way I will take the break. Hi there. Thanks for watching this video. I want you to do four things before you go away. Number one, click on the subscribe button here. And then number two, click on the bell button. That will allow you to get an alert every time we post a new video. And we're posting new videos, edifying interviews and edifying words every week. Number three, please leave a comment on that. Let us know what you think, whether good or bad. And uh, lastly, share this channel with your friends. Let them know that something is happening here. Thank you for joining us. Keep coming back.